Hello guys, this is Panzermeister36. Today's video is going to be a build review, or I guess more like a post-build review, of this kit here, which is TACOM's relatively new kit, the Stug 3 OCG Early Production. Now this video is going to be quite long because I'm going to go into a lot of detail because I'm a Stug 3 aficionado, um, but if you just want to see a, a brief summary, I'll lay it up for you now. Uh, this kit is part of the Blitz line by TACOM. Let's see if I can get a shot of that blitz line, which is supposed to be a simplified build, which can be done in like a weekend, equivalent to like a Tamiya kit. That's definitely true with this kit. You can definitely build this in a weekend, and it doesn't sacrifice too much detail. Uh, it's still quite good and equivalent to a uh, level of detail, at least in the parts I, I feel are simplified, such as the tool clamps. They're equivalent to what you see on brand new border model kits, so it's not that bad at all. Um, a lot of parts are molded together, so you can't, like, let's say the hatches, you can't leave them open because they're all molded shut, but that makes the build way faster. And the only thing that was really finicky are these tiny little photo watch guys here for the, uh, the tow cable. Apart from that, a beginner could definitely build this kit easily, uh, which is kind of the point of the Blitz line. There's, there's some historical inaccuracies and so on. Um, which I point out in the longer version of this, which you can watch if you want to continue here. If you just want to build a cool Stug 3, and the one that is you can build in a weekend, you know, e and it's an easy build, uh, this is definitely a good option. So with that, let's actually start the video. Hello guys, this is Panzermeister 36 and today's video is going to be a post-build review of this kit here. This is TACOM's fairly recent kit that was released in the middle of 2020, the Stug 3 AUSFG Early Production from the Blitz line, which means it's a simplified kit for a weekend build. Now, as with other post-builder reviews I've done recently, instead of just talking about the kit or going through the full process in video, we're going to kind of do both, and I'm going to talk about the kit here after I've built it, but I've filmed the relevant portions and so I will overlay those parts to help me in my description of the kit after I built it here. So you can see kind of how the whole process went. And I can show you any difficult parts, any errors in the instructions, and also any of the changes I made to improve the detail or to fix the uh, historical inaccuracies of the kit. So in the YouTube modeling community, I'm kind of like the Stug 3 ex expert. So I can re review this kit not only from a build standpoint, but also from a historical accuracy standpoint. And as always, I want to start off this video by pointing out, before, before we go into the process of building it, I want to point out all the things I've changed to either correct historical inaccuracies or to make the detail a little bit better to my liking. Those are two classes of changes. So the first class, changes I made to fix historical inaccuracies. You can see I've made some changes to the cupola. I've replaced the smoke launchers with some model cast-in ones. And on the rear of the tank, I added this tow point which we'll go into more detail later and I also didn't put on the rear light they give you because they give you the boxy type of rear light and this vehicle should have the tubular one and I have to go dig a tubular one out of my spares bin from like a dragon kit um, but that's it in terms of the historical problems and they're all relatively minor because they give you the smoke launchers they're just a little bit dimensionally wrong uh, second class of things that I changed which were changes to make it look a little more detailed or whatever. That's things like I replaced the tool clamps with 3D printed ones or model cast in ones. I've got empty tool clamp thingy brackets there. I use these dragon parts for empty spare tire holders. So I've got like a resin damaged wheel there and so on. Um, that's just stuff, to, like I said, to make it look a little bit more detailed to match kind of like my other dragon kits. Um, but that's not necessarily problems with the kit. All right, so I've got a big old list of corrections here, or not corrections, but like things that I did, things of note during the build that I want to overlay in the video. So we're gonna go through the whole process of building this kit, um, basically starting at like the beginning of the instructions. And this way, if you're building the kit, you can kind of follow my video step by step, and it'll all be in order for how you encounter the errors and things in the kit. Um, so I wanna point out first of all that I'm gonna overlay a clip now of what looks like a fair amount of assembly already done on the kit. However, this is just going to be four parts. It's quite amazing because on the equivalent Dragon Stug 3 kit, 
this assembly of four parts is actually on the Dragon Kit going to be at least 45 parts. This Tacom kit, which is in the Tacom Blitz line, is meant to be a kit that you can build, you know, much faster, almost more like a Tamiya kit where you know you can build it easily in a weekend. And that's definitely true for this kit. Um, there is, I guess, like a little bit of simplification um, because of this whole simplified like four part major assembly thing you can't open up the engine deck hatches or the front hatches and so on and I mean some of the detail like the we'll look at later like the tool clamps and stuff like that is quite simplified to go with this kind of like streamlined build process idea but the kit is really really good and for a beginner it's kind of an attractive choice so you really start off the build with the suspension as usual and it just kind of flies together. I know it's cliche to say like the build flies together, but it really does because most of it's already molded on and you have these really nice keyed locating marks and pins on the suspension so that it all gets nicely aligned, which is very, very useful. I want to start off, my first complaint is not really a problem, but it's just the design of the, of the drive sprocket. They have the mold points between the teeth, uh, which is kind of just I mean, I guess it preserves the tooth detail, but then it's also really hard to get in there and clean up the sprue gate because it's between two teeth, and most files are way too big. So you have to use like a knife and get in there and scrape away at it, and it's kind of messy. Um, next up, the idler wheels. Uh, they're missing like that photo etcher ring you get on the dragon kits, uh, which is actually something that should be there. It kind of like goes, it's like a ring that goes inside each half. And I guess it kind of holds the teeth of the wheel of the, of the tracks as they go through. I have a photo from a local museum here, and you can definitely see those rings are present on the real vehicle. Uh, but if you look at the kit, I'll zoom you in here. You can see that the the rings aren't present, and you can definitely see the individual teeth of the tracks through this through the uh, either wheel there. So that's a problem. I'm probably going to just find a spare ring and put it in there. Again, that's not really a problem if you're looking at building this kit on a weekend and having a fun time. I'm pointing at lots of errors or lots of problems right off the bat. It gets better later on, don't worry. But for the wheels, there's a little bit of flash on a couple of the wheels. Only place in the kit there was flash was here, and it's very minor, just so you know. And then when you actually put the wheels together, they don't fit. The way that these Panther three wheels go together in these kits is that you have like the two wheels, the front and the back half and they have like these rods that go between them I guess for strengthening and so the like 90% of this rod is molded onto the back half of the wheel about 10% is molded onto the front half of the wheel and then when you glue them together you know it all kind of mates up and it's perfect except it isn't because the pins are sorry these uh, these I'm calling them rods are in total too long so when you put the wheel halves together they interfere and then the actual mating surface in the middle of the wheel around where the axle is doesn't meet up meet up properly. So what you have to do, or what I did, I have a clip here where on the left side you can see the, the normal half of the outer wheel that has like 10% of that rod. You can see the same type of wheel where I've trimmed that 10% down to like 0% by just taking my sprue cutters and clipping them away. It can be messy like that, but you don't notice it because it's inside the two wheel halves. And then when you do this, when you put the back half of the wheel into the front half of the wheel, the rods no longer interfere and you have a perfect fit. So uh, if you know how to do that, like just my trick here, where you just go in there with the sprue cutters and clip off the like the 10% of the rod on the outer half of the wheel, it doesn't really take any time to correct this slight fit issue. Great benefit here on the wheels is that they have correctly molded the word Continental on there, as we always love. Lots of dragon kits and stuff like that. They, to avoid licensing issues, they have to say Continento with a U at the end, and then you kind of scrape off the back half of the U to make it into a capital L. Uh, I guess Tagum doesn't care about licensing, they just went right for it, and on the wheels, the row wheels and the return rollers, they have the beautiful molded Continental, very fine lettering, which uh, is beautiful, and it's really, really good to have that on there. Some kits completely omit it, and some kits have it incorrectly spelt, like I told you, to avoid licensing issues. On the whole rear, the first thing I want to point out is that there's a, um, they kind of show the assembly in an order that I would not recommend, where they show first, I guess you kind of put on sheet metal parts, and then you put on 
the rear armor and then you slide this vent in between them and you should definitely not do that because you're going to have a tough time getting that full wedge part in there. Um, so what I recommend doing is the exact opposite. First you want to glue the rear hull armor onto the rear plate and then you want to glue the full wedge mesh onto the bottom of that and then you want to put the sheet metal parts on at the very end, these like thin plastic parts that are just like air deflectors and so on. And I've got a video of showing that order here. You want to do it this way, otherwise you're going to have a tough time getting that full wedge piece wedged in there if you follow the tack on build or order. Um, now a great benefit of the way they've molded this kit is that they have the, the idler wheel shields molded as one part. If you've never built a Dragon Stug 3, you've got no idea what I'm talking about. On Dragon Stug 3s and Panzer 3s, this is like a two-part assembly that never fits properly. But on this kit, it's a really nice... It's kind of like wrapped around the mold of the rear plate, I guess. I don't know how they did it, but it's really, really good, and it's, it looks really, really good. So I'll release the clips, and you can see this is kind of like curved cast piece um, that rolls over the idler wheel adjusting mechanism. One piece, beautiful assembly there. Uh, next up, I had to add, so that this is the first historical inaccuracy we're going to hit in our process here. This kit represents an early production Stug 3 built about March 1943 at the Miag factory. Now, this is already getting like way into like factory features and stuff like that. But basically, the these vehicles, they had a tow point molded onto the rear of the hull, onto this hemispherical cover that's like an access port. So on my kit here, you can see that there's like this two-pronged thing there with some holes in it. This I have completely scratch built, um, and it, it's in real life it's like cast onto this blob here, which is like this hemispherical cover that just accesses the engine or whatever like that. So I have a, a paper here that showed how I scratch built it. I just used some sheet styrene and made two of these pieces here that are like you know thin pieces that have a curve here and a curve there, which I just I just cut them from sheet styrene, took a round file, went in there. And then I took a straight file and just filed that around, drilled a hole through it, and then I made like these tiny little squares and this kind of piece I bent. I wanted to do this as one piece, but when I bent it, the end snapped off, so that's why they're separate here. The end result is something that looks like this, where you got like two prongs and it kind of like connects in the middle with this curve. And then I covered it in putty, which is why it's all gray now. I'll overlay a clip of it before I put the putty on there and you can probably see how it went together a little bit better. Um, yeah, this is like a crazy historical accuracy thing that if that I bet nobody really cares about apart from me. I'm just letting you know that um, historically that piece should be kind of on there. Um, these are problems that are also in like the Dragon equivalent kit is this. Um, nobody gets these tiny things right, but to me that's an important feature, that Miag toe point on the rear. Oh, and before we go to the front of the tank, I want to Look back at the rear again, and I also added, if you can see, ooh, where are we at? These tiny photo etch chains. Those did not come in the kit. I added them to make this match the level of detail on my other Stoke 3s in my collection. Next up, I want to cover the assembly of the tracks. In this kit, we have the very nice style of tracks, which is quite modern, of what we call link and length, in that you get individual links and you get assembled lengths of track. I'll overlay some video of it for you guys just to see. But basically you get these sprues where you have, you know, like 30 individual link tracks and then some straight sections. Some straight sections are short, some are longer. And it all just has to do with assembling this full run of tracks. So I'll show you just kind of briefly here what you get. So you get like a long straight piece for the bottom. I think you use like one individual link here, a straight section of about six tracks, and then you have maybe like 10 individual link tracks that all meet this curve of the sprocket. Then you have one big long straight piece on the top there that comes with the sag molded in, which is very nice. And then kind of like on the front, you once again have about 10 or 12 individual links to make that curve. Another short straight section, individual link, and then you're back around there. So what this does is it takes what would be 100 or I guess 95 individual link tracks, and it turns it into about 20 to 25 individual link tracks and then a bunch of straight sections so it really speeds up the assembly of the tracks 
and it's a good compromise between the level of detail of individual link tracks and the ease of like a rubber band track. You're kind of meeting a nice middle point there. And I do really like this. Now you did have some pin marks on the on like the longer straight sections. I'll show them in the clip here. Um, there's like a couple of pin marks, but they're really easy because they're raised, so you just get in there with a file and just scrape them down basically. It took like five seconds. And then you put it all together, assembly is a breeze, and in the instructions they show you like, you know, put like five individual links here and then one straight section and then so on. If you follow that order, you get perfect uh, track fitting, everything like that. Which is good because you can't adjust the other wheel, so you can't adjust the track tension, but the way they tell you to put them together with the individual link tracks and the, and the assembled links is perfect. Alright, next up, the tool clamps and the tools and the kit. Uh, they come quite simplified. I'll overlay a video of that now showing a, an axe and a tow cable clamp. As you can see they're molded on and they kind of don't look that great. Uh, this is an acceptable level of detail to most people. Give this a wash and even the solid molded axe clamp handle will look decent. Um, but I actually went ahead and I replaced them with 3D printed and model casting tool clamps. Basically you just sand off the molded on tool clamps and then you just pop the uh, clamps off the off the fret I guess for this like a 3D printed one I'm going to show you slide it onto the, the crowbar and put it in place and it's just a thing I did to increase the little detail don't worry about that you don't have to do it um, but if anybody's curious I used the following sets so I used this set here which has the jack clamps and the tote cable clamps I used, and also the smoke launchers we'll look at later. And then the 3D printed black clamps are these MJ Miniatures sets. I don't want to waste too much time on this because that's not part of the kit review, but just so you know, so you can see I replaced the tool clamps. You can see the black and the brown. Same thing on this side here with the jack and so on, and the sledgehammer back there. I also carved wood, wood detail, like wood texture, into the jack block here um, because you don't get that in the kit it's just a molded solid square so I went in there and I kinda added that texture if you can see it dragon kits have that texture molded on but this kit did not there's an error in the instructions where they show you mounting the tow cable before mounting the fender supports and the uh, S hooks and other tools like that and it's really a bad idea because as you can see on the other side of the instruction sheet here the tow cable goes over top of these details, so if you put the cable on first, it's going to be in the way of putting these details on. So just be aware that you should put the tow cable on after you've mounted the fender supports, which are these guys, and like this little rib here, and so on. And also on this side, there's the S hooks here. Put those parts on first, and then the cable on after. All right, now continuing on the theme of the uh, tools. The only part of this build that would make me think that, that this kit is not appropriate for beginners are these photo etched guys here. These are a pain in the butt. Um, they, what they do in real life is, you can see on the side with a tow cable. By the way, this, this kit, copper cable comes in the kit. It's very nice. Um, but you can see that they kind of like, in real life, these things hold the tow cable as it gets wrapped around. And I'll show you what the thing looks like in real life. There's an actual piece of one. This is actually like a real original part off a tank, like I stood through like this. It's a little bit damaged, you can see it's a little bit bent. But you can kind of see the profile, it's like a straight part and then it loops around and it's screwed onto the fender there. And it holds the tow cable. So they want you to, to fold that out of a tiny photo etch piece. And it is very difficult, even on the Dragon Smart Kits this piece is a plastic part and honestly it doesn't look that bad um, but folding these parts out of photo etch is tricky even for me luckily I managed to do it and didn't lose any but it's very very tricky because these parts are very small and you know like I was saying a minute ago this is the part that makes me think that this kit would not be appropriate for beginners because if I was beginning I have no idea how to even approach that piece I'd break it or lose it now of course you could always just leave them off and then it's like whatever so if you're a beginner and you have this kit you might want to consider doing that because those parts are super fine and they're going to be a pain in the butt to try to fold them because they were even for me 
um, but they, they look good once you put them on. They match the level of detail I've added with the 3D printed tool clamps everywhere else. Another fairly minor error is that in the instructions they show you mounting both of these little hooks aligned, when in reality, as you can see, the one that's further back should be more like perpendicular to it. Uh, very, very minor, you just put it on a different angle, but I'll show you the instructions so you can kind of see how it differs versus what I have done here. Now on the subject of the uh, photo wedge here, I guess we should also look at just kind of like overall this kit's photo wedge. It's quite minimal. Uh, you have just like these vent parts, you have the three vents, um, some bolt strips on the edge deck, little parts for the fender sides, and then you have like little, like those four little tow cable clamps and also a little part that kind of is a similar piece that goes underneath the, uh, I guess the wire cutters on the engine deck. So that's a very minimal photo wedge, which is attractive to a new beginner. So, like I said, some of those small parts, the, the four cable holders and the thing that I'll show you here, it's, you can probably see a tiny little piece of photo wedge kind of like in there underneath that. Yeah, that's the, that's the other guy there. It's a very tricky parts, but you can always just leave them off if they're, if they're scaring you or they're giving you trouble. The key photo wedge that they give you in the kit are the, the vents, which is like one here, one on the other side, one underneath, which I looked at earlier, it goes underneath there. And they also have these strips of photo wedge that are kind of like here. And uh, there's actually a problem with these, I'll show you in a video. These parts should be opposites, they should be mirror images of each other because they go on either side of the tank. And it's essentially a rectangular strip of tread pattern because the fender kind of rolls up here. And it's like a triangular cutout on one side. But the triangular cutout is on the same side on both of them. So when you put that on the tank, it would be wrong on one side. But it's actually very easy to correct this because these parts are also too long. So for one of them, I just cut off some of the square end, and that keeps the profile exactly the same. And then on the other one, I cut off the triangular end, which is already on the wrong side, and then I just kind of cut that triangular profile back into the other edge. You can probably see that very clearly in the video, and then that, that solves the problem of that they're oversized, and also the fact that they're, one of them is the wrong way around and that the triangular section is incorrect. The triangular section should be up against the fender support, so this one should go that and a triangle there. And then this one's the mirror image because it goes like that and has a triangle down there. You can also see there's some uh, PE bolted strips that kind of go along here on the, side, on the side of the engine deck there. That's purely because of the fact that they had to mold, or they wanted to mold as much of the upper area as one big piece as possible to make it simple and easy to build. And because of that, they had to basically put those bolted strips as separate because they couldn't slide mold them on the engine deck when the whole engine deck is part of the whole upper hull, which is already one big mega piece. But though all these photo watch parts I'm talking about, the, the vents, the, the strips of uh, fender support or fender texture or whatever, and these bolted strips, they're all very easy because they're nice just big flat pieces. So all you need is some super glue and you just kind of put them on even, even if you're a beginner. Shouldn't be too much trouble. Another side effect of the molding of the whole thing is in, in big pieces is that you have uh, you have this on some Tacom kits. You have these kind of like sprue gates that are just sitting on the top of the hull. On my Merkava, they were kind of exposed in bad spots, but luckily on this kit, they did it in a very smart way. And they had the only one I could find. They designed it so that it was underneath where the uh, the toolbox goes on the engine deck. So you don't even have to worry about it. I think that's an excellent engineering decision right there. Good job, Tacom. Next up on the engine deck, we have the um, the spare wheel holders. So as you can see here, there actually are no spare wheels in them because I want to go with my story of the vehicle being damaged, as you can see here. I want these to be the spare wheels. I'm going to paint them as such that were usually mounted here and here. Now you can't really do that in the kit as they deliver it because these rings, as I'll show in the video here, are actually molded onto the spare wheels that they give you. Um, so what I did was I just simply took the parts that are on the kit currently in front of me off of a spare dragon kit because they have those molded separately from the spare wheels in the dragon kits. So that's just a, uh, a thing I did to make my detail or my story of the damaged kit like relevant. 
um, but just be aware that you can't do that with the way that they give you the kit. Alrighty, next up we're going to look at the superstructure. Coming to the end of the story here, but oh, this video is going to be super long, isn't it? <laughs> Alright, so the grenade launcher tubes are too narrow. And I will show you that here on the kit. So, as I explained earlier, these brown ones you see on there are from a model cast and set. And I'm going to take one of the kit ones, I'm going to slide it inside here to illustrate the fact that they are completely out of scale. So as you can see, you can actually slide, I don't want to put it too far, but the kit parts actually fit into the model cast in smoke launchers. Um, so when you assemble the smoke launchers in the kit, it definitely doesn't look right. Because um, they're too narrow, so they kind of just sit like this, separated from each other. In real life, they should be all touching each other like this because they're thicker than they are in the kit. I'll show a, f a, f a photo of it here on a real vehicle. Um, but yeah, the kit parts are under scale. Very minor. Uh, nobody probably really cares about this other than me. <laughs> but to me, that was a glaring uh, thing that I noticed. I'm like, this does not look right at all. And lo and behold, those parts are definitely under scale. Also, I'm going to pop the photo back up again now. And note that there's these little notches in them. Um, the notches should all kind of be in a line as the smoke launcher barrels kind of like rotate around. In the kit, they don't tell you to do that. So just be aware that the notches in these tubes, um, they should kind of all connect in a line. When I assembled the gun, I encountered a problem in that the gun did not fit into the sleeve. You know, it's like another fit issue, like with the with the wheels. These fit issues are not rare on TACOM kits. They do have a, a little bit of a, uh, a history of this, but it's actually very easy. I just sanded it down a little bit, and then it slides in. It took like two seconds. And very nicely, they have a key in the sleeve so that when you mount when you mount the barrel in there, it kind of locks in in a way that the muzzle brake will always be facing in the correct direction and won't be sideways or upside down. That's very, very good. I also did add a, a well on top of the recuperator, I believe it's called, housing. So for example, here's where it appears on the kit. Um, it's convenient to put this weld on there because it also covers up the big seam in, the, in between the two halves of these parts for the recuperator housing. So just using a little weld like that is a really, really handy way to kill two birds with one stone because there should be a weld there and it covers up that seam line. Next up, one of the most common errors I see with Stoke 3 kits is that nobody understands that in real life the gun shield for the loader, machine gun shield here, it can't stand on its own. It has to be propped up by the front half of the loader's hatch. All the kits out there get this wrong. Um, except for maybe some dragon ones. So in the instructions you'll see that the the shield is magically floating upright with the hatch just closed. In real life that doesn't happen. Uh, you have to prop it upright. And if you try to do that, you'll notice that the little molded on blob that simulates kind of like the locking pin does not even align with the similar locking point on the loader's hatch. It is offset to the side so you can't even do it properly with how they give you the stuff in the kit. So on my kit here, I had to add like a little piece of copper, you can probably see it there, it's like a little piece of copper wire in like a little S profile. Let's see if I can get a different angle. Ooh, it's pretty tricky to see it, there you go. So I had to move it over, I had to move it over so I met up with this guy right here which has a hole in it that locks into it. And that's how in real life the loader's shield is held upright by the loader's hatch. Another very important tip when building Stug 3s is that on all the kits out there, they always show you gluing this little bolted piece here over top of the recuperator. They always show you gluing it onto the superstructure when what you really should do is glue it onto the roof. Because that way, when you take the roof off, you can always take the gun out for painting. Because you can't really paint in all the cracks here with, the, with that piece in place. If you glue this this piece right here onto the superstructure, like they always show you. Um, then you can't take the then you can't take the gun out once you glue that piece on. You're kind of stuck with painting in all the crevices around there. So I'll show you how I do it, but I always do this now. It's very straightforward. Just hold that piece in place and hit it a little bit extra thin on the seam line, and then when you take that piece off. It is part of the roof, and there's no interference between um, or no interference when r removing the gun for painting. It's also very helpful if you're doing like a kit with an interior, like a dragon kit, 
so you can paint the gun breech as well. Alrighty, now we're going to hit on the last thing in this kit, and that is the cupola. And this was the place where I put the most work in, purely to fix the historical inaccuracies of the kit. Again, this is all fairly minor stuff to people who just want to build the kit, and if you just want to build the kit, you can completely skip this section because it's irrelevant. But basically, um, the kit gives you an accurate cupola that's historically correct to a vehicle that was assembled correctly. But these early production Stoke 3 House of G's from the Miag factory, which is what this kit represents. You can tell it's a Miag factory by the style of fender support. And like I point out, the toe point on the back is also important for that. When they first built these early Stoke 3 G's, they assembled them incorrectly. Or they got their cupolas assembled for them at a sub supplier or whatever incorrectly. The Stoke 3 cupola is basically an octagon with seven periscopes and one blank spot. And usually the blank spot coincides with the location where the where the hinge is for the hatch. And then because the hatch opens from front to back, you can see the hinge right there. Usually that blank spot is at the back because you don't need to see backwards, right? So you've got the blank spot there and then you've got seven periscopes around there. And then you got the hatch there that opens up like this, you know, hinges open. But then these early cupolas were assembled incorrectly at Miag, where the blank spot was opposite to the hinge. As you can see here, I've made the blank spot here with some styrene, and the hinge is over here. And so similarly, there's a periscope at that side now. Remember correctly, the blank spot should be here, so that the, so that the hatch opens like this, and you've got the seven periscopes all like that, and then you've got the blank spot at the back of the octagon. But whatever they did, they messed it up. And then to make that basically the hatch still opens correctly, it swings open backwards because the, the hinge is still here. But because there's also a periscope at that point, then they get the blank spot is opposite to where the hinge is, which is forward. And I mean that's kind of dumb because now you can't see where you're going. And you'll often see these things field modified, where instead they're like this, and then the hatch opens forward, which looks kind of dumb. But then at least the periscopes were all in the right spots. And I, I did this by just basically carving it up. I uh, sliced off the molded on blank spot and then I just, you know, sand that down. And then I used some sheet styrene to make a new blank spot on the opposite side, sand that down to fit. You know, it wasn't too much of a problem, um, but this is a crazy, this is a crazy historical thing, by the way, if you care about this, but. Um, you know, it's just something I did because it make it accurate. Another thing I also did, if you can see close there, is that I changed the bump stop. In the kit, they give you the later type bump stop, which is a very small disc, which allows the hatch to open, and then it lays flat, resting against the back of the uh, cupola ring here. These earlier vehicles have this 45 degree bump stop thingy. I'll show a photo of it. A photo of it also on one of these early vehicles, because you can see there's a periscope underneath it. Um, and then, as you can see in the photo, it opens up at like a 45 degree angle because it's a much bigger bump stop thing. So I also did that and I had to scratch build that bump stop using a piece of styrene, like a sprue gate or something, and then also just a little bit of photo which I bent by hand. <sighs> and that's about it for this kit. So my summary of this kit is that it's actually very good. The historical accuracies are kind of similar or they're equivalent to what you see in a dragon kit arguably better because they've actually fixed the orientation of the uh, fire extinguisher when Dragon lets you put it any way you want. So these kits are actually technically more historically accurate than the Dragon Smart kits, which is quite impressive. Um, and this kit also builds up very nicely. Like I said, the fit issues are very minor. There was just a little bit of flash on some of the wheels. The wheel pins are too long, but you just clip them off on one half and it's, it goes together fine. And also the gun sleeve was a little bit too narrow, but I just sanded down the other side and fit together perfectly. Uh, the other changes I made were increasing detail, which is my personal tastes. And then, of course, there were adding the historical corrections like the uh, cupola, smoke launchers, and the toe point on the back. Also, the rear light. Uh, Dragon on their, on their kit, which is like Dragon 6320, I think. They also have the cupola wrong. They also are missing the toe point on the back. Um, I guess they at least have the smoke launchers the right size. 
but my my TLDR, which I probably should put at the beginning, not at the end, is that this kit is very good. It is excellent. Um, it's a fun build. You could build this definitely in a weekend. It's, it's like Tamiya level build, and uh, there's very minimal flash and seam lines and everything like that. It's very, very fun. If you don't care about historical accuracy, this looks like an excellent Stoke 3. Detail is quite good. It's got nice welds and everything like that. Uh, the only downside, I guess, is that it doesn't have any interior detail. Like, there's nothing apart from just the gun, which just ends right here anyways. But the hatches are all molded close anyways, apart from the ones up here. So that's not really much of a problem. And the Lincoln Link tracks, I definitely love those. I do prefer them to individual Link tracks because they look as good when they mold the sag in the top run. So it's like, I don't know what's the point of complaining. It saves time, and it looks just as good, so I do like it. Um, yeah, so I do recommend this kit. Uh, beginners might want to be aware of some of the minor photo etch parts, like uh, those four guys that hold the clamp or the cable in place, and also the similar thing underneath the uh, wire cutters on the other side. And apart from that, if you just, you know, beware of the couple things I point out in the instructions where there's like order errors and stuff like that, um, like on the rear of the tank, assembling the rear armor, and also when you're assembling the cable, uh, you should be fine. Um, it's a good kit. I do like it. And if you want to build a Stoke 3, this is definitely a good contender for it. Thanks for watching, guys.